Hi everyone, this week we're going to look closely at randomized experiments. Uh, a few weeks ago when we began talking about causation, we, we uh, mentioned um, intervening in the world or experimentation as a way to, um, to get at cause and effect and, and um, we just sort of made that point uh, generally that there's a difference between intervening in the world, trying to make something happen, and watching the world, you know, as, as in an observational study. Uh, but, but now we're going to look at what an experimental study actually um, looks like. There are some details in the design of modern experiments, such as random assignment, and um, we'll take a look at uh, the logic of that and, and some examples and some variations on on randomized experiments. So we'll look at the first uh, consider a bit about the importance of randomized experiments to public policy. Uh, we'll look at, as I mentioned, the the notion of random assignment and and what that is and, it, and its core logic. And then we'll look at various settings and types of, of um, randomized experiments. And um, we'll talk about generalizability, which is one of the uh, potential weaknesses of, of some randomized experiments. And, and the problem of human artifacts in experiments, a bit about the analysis of randomized experiments, and then, and then some ethical issues. So to begin with the importance of randomized experiments, so um, ra rather than kind of talk about that point in this, um, in this lecture, I, I will just remind you to, uh, to watch the video by um, Esther Duflo, who's uh, uh, the uh, director and, and a development economist at the um, uh, Poverty Action Lab, which is uh, a really interesting uh, group of researchers who apply uh, experimental methods to um, development um, and, and anti-poverty programs uh, around the world. And she, she, her video makes the, the case for um, the importance of randomized experiments applied to social policy. Um, and, and, the, and I should just mention, so that, that's a um, and we talk about this in the book, uh, there's a growing movement um, in the United States and around the world, really, of using, of, 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 of relying more or um, using more randomized experiments to, to judge um, various social policies, education reforms, um, um, anti-poverty programs, and, 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 and just a wide range of, of um, um, public policies. Uh, it's, so the randomized experiment is quite common in health, in the health sciences. Um, but the, what's, new now, what's new is the push to kind of make it a more um, widespread standard of, of evidence in, in other areas. Um, so there are, there are various groups uh, in, the, in the United States, for example, the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy. There's this Poverty Action Lab. Um, and, uh, um, and others that uh, the Institute for Educational Sciences, for example, within the Department of Education, that are, um, have for some years actually have been pushing for more widespread use of randomized experiments. So, um, and the reason for that, I should just mention, as, as, as Duflo, the point that she makes is that it's really sort of only with this kind of research design do you really know um, what works. Um, and you, where you can really find out um, the, um, the uh, causal uh, efficacy of, 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 of interventions. So, um, so it's an important topic because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a key uh, type of research, randomized experiments, but it's also an increasingly promoted um, way of, of, of demonstrating the effectiveness or the, the lack of effectiveness of, of, of policies and programs. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is turn to the, uh, the article for this week, which is um, uh, an interesting study. It looks at the effects of uh, a form of, it, of in driving insurance or accident insurance called pay-as-you-drive uh, uh, vehicle insurance, and it's a it's a study in the Netherlands that looks at the effect of the, this kind of insurance on um, the driving habits of, of younger younger drivers. Now, um, 
Now, as the, as the article points out, so this is this is an important issue. Uh, accidents cause uh, over a million deaths around the world every year. Auto accidents, and younger drivers are much more likely to be involved in um, in major accidents and in deadly accidents. And it's one of the leading causes of death of of young people all around the world. So this is this is a major. Um, uh, um, health and safety issue, uh, and of course, governments have the power through regulation to require or encourage certain kinds of insurance. And so, this pay-as-you-drive insurance is 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 could be could be one of those. Um, <clears throat> now, let's um, uh, now let's let's look at the uh, logic of this kind of experiment. Um, so, this is the figure from the book. It's, uh, it's figure 14.1 and it shows the components of a randomized experiment, the most basic parts of it. Now, now studies including the study of, of pay-as-you-go um, um, driving insurance um, does have, have each study, experimental study can have different parts, additional parts, but these, these are the basic um, uh, components. And let's just walk through them um, for this study in particular. So this study had to recruit participants it did that online. It re reached out to several thousand people, but only a few hundred agreed to participate. It's not a probability sample. It's a kind of voluntary sample, which is true of a lot of experiments. Um, and then those young drivers were um, randomly assigned. And, and one group ended up getting this special pay-as-you-drive insurance, which um, I'll talk about in a bit. And, and the that's the treatment group. So they, they got the, the treatment, which is the, the kind of the causal intervention of interest, the, the policy or program of interest. And the control group did not. They did not get this pay-as-you-drive insurance. And, uh, but they were formed randomly, and we'll talk a bit about that. But that's like the flip of a coin. So um, they didn't get to choose which group they were in. They weren't selected by their drive, past driving habits. It was just the use of a random number that determined who got into the treatment group and the control group. And that's important because that creates a kind of, what we'll talk about, a kind of statistical equivalence between these groups. So they're, they're matched in, a, in at least a sort of statistical sense. And then the treatment group got the treatment. So the treatment, uh, that's kind of a medical word, but it, it applies also to you know a form of education or a form of information or a, a policy change. So the treatment is the the causal, um, the ca the causal kind of agent of, of of interest, and in this case, it's that form of insurance. So now I'll talk a bit about the pay for performance or pay for, pay as you drive rather insurance, which which um, um, reduces people's um, in monthly insurance, car insurance premiums, depending on how they drive. So if they drive safely, they stay within the speed limit, and I, and there's some other bonuses too, like if they avoid weekend evening driving. Um, uh, but mo most of the bonus is tied to staying within the speed limit. And um, if they drive s safely, you know, um, according to the GS GIS technology that's installed in their cars, at the end of the month, they'll see a bonus of up to 50 euros um, in, in this study, which is a fairly substantial amount of money. Now, the control group doesn't doesn't get that. They Their bonus and insurance payments doesn't depend at all on how they drive. Um, I guess there, there was a website connected with this in, in which the treatment group could look up how much uh, it was saving, um, but apparently not, that many, not many people uh, did that. There was it seemed to be just more a general awareness that they were being um, earning earning some kind of bonus by by staying within the speed limit. So that's the treatment that that form of insurance, um, which is now you know more technologically feasible with with um, you know um, relatively low cost GIS technology. And then and then the cons then so one group gets the treatment, the other group does not get the treatment. And then the interest is in cons comparing the outcomes. So in other words, how, how did their driving behavior change? So um, and for the treatment group, what, how did their driving behavior change? And then in the control group, how did their uh, driving behavior change? And, uh, and the essential question is a, is a comparison um, of, of the treatment group and the control group. Now, just to point out, the control group represents 
a kind of counterfactual. Since it's statistically equivalent, it represents sort of what would likely be the behavior of the treatment group had they not gotten this uh, um, pay-as-you-drive insurance. So that the, this control group sort of, what happens to this control group models in a way the behavior of the treatment group had it not gotten the, the treatment. And then, um, so let, let's just look at, let's look at the results. Okay, so what you see here, the dotted line, or the dashed line, I should say, is the um, driving habits of the control group. And the solid line is the driving habits of the um, uh, treatment group, okay? And uh, so they were hooked up with the technology, the GIS technology, in the beginning period. And these two periods here, represented by these two dots and these two dots, these middle two periods, are when the, the uh, um, um, pay-as-you-drive uh, bonuses uh, kicked in for the, uh, for the treatment group. So uh, what's interesting about this, well, first of all, the article mentions that this overall upward trend, so over here on the left-hand side is the percentage of the, um, the percentage of the time they were driving that they were, they were speeding. And so you can see it's in the range of, you know, maybe about 17% to about 20, 21% or so. Um, so overall, you know, maybe a fifth of the time uh, they were uh, um, a sixth or a fifth of the time they were driving above the speed limit. Um, there's a, a gradual upward trend for the um, for the control group, and the authors attribute th this to the to the GIS technology that was monitoring their behavior. That um, the feeling was that people knew that the GIS technology had been installed in their cars, and so at first they were kind of aware that their driving was mo being monitored, and they sort of slow down their driving as a result of that. And as the months went on, they began to, I guess, forget about the GIS technology and, and their um, driving uh, uh, habits returned kind of to their more normal state. So this, the authors kind of interpret this roughly 20% level here as kind of what the typical speeding level would be of, of had they not been monitored earlier in the, in the process. Now here, <clears throat> so that's kind of interesting. So this, that's, that's, uh, points out the usefulness of a counterfactual because an experiment is not, even the control group is observed or watched or, or monitored and sometimes even watching people changes their behavior and so you want to know what the effect of that is as opposed to the effect of the intervention. So we, we, if we take this dotted line as what would have happened to the treatment group had they not gotten the treatment, then we compare that to the what really did happen to the treatment group when they were monitored and that's the, these two dots here. So the, this is the period during which they could earn that um, good driving bonus of up to 50 euros, so um, 50 euros for each month. And, um, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look. We'll take a, so you can see what, what, in a sense, you can see what, what happened. There, um, they began, um, the treatment group began at a speeding rate roughly comparable to the control group of around... 18% of the time, 18 and a half percent of the time, they were driving above the speed limit. But then the control group actually increased its um, speeding to 19%. But the treatment group reduced its speeding down to more like 17 and a half percent. Where and and also in, in the second period when they had the bonus, again the control group kept increasing its speed because it was, I guess, you know, you know, began to be less sensitive to the GIS monitoring. So this difference here, uh, at least according to the study authors, is the best guess as to what the true causal effect of the program is, because now the control group is sort of at the point where they're ignoring the, the um, GIS, and the treatment group is also presumably at that stage, but they're paying attention to the bonuses. And um, so it's a... Uh, you know, it's a roughly two percentage point um, uh, um, difference in, in speeding, but a, but um, uh, it's uh, so it's not a large effect, but it but it does appear that this uh, pay as you go driving is causing a change in behavior. Now, this last period here, where the where the line drops jumps back up again, that's a period in which um, the bonuses are are removed, and so now the treatment group is back to where. It was with no um, bonus or incentive to um, drive uh, within the speed limit again. Their and their behavior jumps up, similar to where it is uh, um, with the control group.